In this screencast, our main focus is going to be on uh, interpolation, the routines available in SciPy for interpolation. Before we do that, though, let's talk a little bit about starting up IPython, since there's been some problems that have arisen with this, uh, partially because of the way that Anaconda sets things up and systems that don't make this easy for you. So again, when I started up, I always started up with the PyLab option. This auto loads a bunch of stuff for us, populates our namespace so that we can just quickly and easily use routines like sines and cosines and plotting and all these sorts of things. We can tell it has worked because it also it's loaded in all the matplotlib stuff and tells me it's using some back end, that will be whatever it needs to be. But the fact that it lists this tells me that it has started this up. Okay, so things like the plot command exist, okay, etc., just like we saw in the first lab. Now, if you're starting this up, you know, by clicking on some shortcut or however silly systems do these sorts of things, it probably doesn't have this for you already. There's ways of changing that, but we can also do it directly inside IPython. So there's lots of other commands, percent commands. You can see a list of them. Okay, we haven't and won't talk about most of these, but an important one is PyLab. If we run this, notice it gives me the using matplotlib backend and tells me, and it also tells me it's populating the interactive namespace for NumPy and matplotlib, loading in all the commands that we want. So even if we had started this up without the PyLab option, this gives it to us. So this is a convenient way of making sure that our system is, is set up correctly and we're ready to work. Uh, so hopefully that will alleviate some of the problems that have been encountered. Okay, so that's great, but what we're really here for is interpolation. So we need to import the appropriate module. The appropriate module is SciPy interpolate. Uh, as always, I like to give it a short, shorter name. Here I'll call it inter. Now we could call it int. Int does mean something else. Probably not something that we would normally use, but I pr still prefer not to override things um, when possible, uh, when it's possible to avoid it. Okay, so we've loaded that in. The first thing we do is we check the documentation. Now, I'll have to say the documentation and even the overall structure of this module is not good. It's frankly a mess. I've seen some discussions of people talking about cleaning it up, but you know it hasn't happened yet. So we're going to have to live with what's here. Unfortunately, we're only going to need a few routines, so we'll be able to just focus on those. Um, one important thing to, to note, and this is going to be true of many of the modules we look at, they'll often tell us that it's a wrapper or based on something something pack. That's usually a sign of the pack, fit pack in this case, is some ancient routines, set of routines, written many, many years ago, well tested, well established, um, and we just get to use a nice interface for. Okay, maybe in this case not a super nice interface, but it's still much nicer than using the raw routines themselves. So there is a long list of routines here and lots of funny things. Man, okay, so really, uh, this isn't all that useful. So let's just look at the routines that are available. Well, even this isn't too useful because there's a lot of things here. Crazy, you know, all lowercase, camel casing, just really a disaster. Um, so let's not even focus on that too much. There's just a few routines that we're going to talk about here, and you're certainly free to look at some of the other ones yourself. In fact, encouraged to do so. Um, so we're going to want to use a test case. So let's define a function as a test case. Again, we're going to give it a bad name, just e to the minus x over 3. Let's pick some x values. Let's calculate some y values from our function. Okay. Uh, let's even plot them. <coughs> okay, whoops, let's make sure the plot is actually on the screen. There we go. Okay, so um, here's our function. Our function is defined by the points in here, and now we're going to want to be able to make statements about that. So the first thing that we, we can do is we can look at the Lagrange interpolating polynomial, and there's a routine that does that for us. So if we look at the documentation, it, what do you know, returns to the Lagrange interpolating polynomial. We give it 
two arrays, x, okay, they call it w, I typically call it y, okay, and it's going to return a polynomial that goes through the points. Okay. It even warns us that, this, that the, it's not numerically stable. Okay. If you give it more than 20 or so points, even if they're chosen quite intelligently, this can return, well, garbage. <coughs> Notice what it says, it returns a NumPy poly1D instance, which is the Lagrange interpolating polynomial. Right, what does that mean? Okay, uh, yeah, so let's just call this. Okay, so if we run this, we see it does return something. It returns a list of numbers, but it also has this poly1D here. Okay, what this really means is it returns a 1D polynomial or a polynomial in one variable. These are the coefficients of that polynomial. Okay. Starting with um, uh, the, the lowest one, so it's really kind of what I would consider the reverse order of what makes sense to me, but well, there's good reasons why it's done this way. So this is the coefficient to the highest order term. This is the constant term. Okay, well that's nice, but I don't know, let's just call it a name, we'll just call it poly. Okay, poly is that thing. We can look at documentation for it. Tells us that this is a 1D polynomial. One-dimensional polynomial has various parameters that we can look at. Okay, that's not terribly useful. It's got string form. Okay, once again, I'm going to say this numerous times, but in this section, the documentation is not very good. So the best that we can do is just play with it. One thing I will mention is that if we do print the string representation of the polynomial, it prints the string representation of the polynomial. And on maybe better co consoles, this might even look nicer. Okay, so we can actually look at it. Of course, looking at it is not really all that we're, it's not all that interesting. Uh, we can look at what um, methods it has or what it can do. Okay, so for example, it does have the coefficients, so if we wanted to get our hands on them, we can get them. It can do derivatives and integrals, okay, as we talked about, so we can do a derivative. Uh, what the derivative does is it returns the derivative as a polynomial, so it returns it in the same type of object as we got back from Lagrange. It will just be the derivative and we can ask it for whatever derivative we want. Okay, by default, it does the first derivative, but we could ask for the second, third, tenth. Okay, at some point, it becomes silly, um, but we can do that. Um, and similar with the integral, it even has order. So we can see that this is a ninth order polynomial, uh, which we could also see from the string representation we saw before. Okay, well, this polynomial object is something that we can feed an array to, and it evaluates the polynomial at all those points. So what might be useful is to construct a finer grid. So let's go from 0 to 9 in steps of, uh, or I mean, a 1,000 values, which is way overkill. Okay. And there we go. It calculates all of them for us. Perhaps what's a nicer thing to do is to plot this. So let's plot the polynomial evaluated at that point. At, the, at those points, I don't know, let's make it a red line. Okay. And we see that, yes, the polynomial goes, the Lagrange interpreting polynomial goes through all the points as it must. It's reasonably well behaved for a simple function like this. Life is good. Okay. Now, <coughs> that's great, but as we increase the number of points, eventually this will fail, and we'll see more of that in class. The next thing that we can uh, do is say, well, okay, we want to move beyond the Lagrange interpolating polynomial. And so there's these various, uh, whoops, interp routines. These do the general interpolations, 1D, 2D, and ND. The only one we're going to be interested in is 1D. Okay. So again, we feed it X and Y. We tell it what type of interpolation we want. And then there's a handful of other um, options which we're not going to talk about won't be of, of interest to us. So again, X and Y are arrays. We're just going to treat 
uh, y is 1d, and then kind tell us the type of interpolation we want to do. We can do linear interpolation, which is the default. Okay, that's the equivalent of what a plot does. Okay, and then we can do all these other sorts of things, nearest to some sort of nearest neighbor algorithm. Okay, we're not going to talk about these. Okay. These, the rest of them, s linear, quadratic, cubic refer to spline interpolation. So you can either do piecewise linear, piecewise quadratic, piecewise cubic. Okay? Or, in fact, we can specify the o an integer, in which case it will do a spline using that order integer, that integer order uh, interpolation. So if you give it 5, it would do fifth order polynomials okay? instead of cubic polynomials. Okay. That's nice, uh, but this so this sounds nice, like a nice interface, but it's actually pretty limited in what it does. So let's just try it out. So again, let's feed it x and y. I don't know. Let's do a cubic spline interpolation. Okay. Once again, it returns us something. Okay. So let's I don't know. Call that c spline. Once again, we can look at the documentation for it. And again, it, it's not really helping us. It's telling us basically what we already know. Okay, This is just a repeat of what we already saw. And then there is at least a little things here using the same function I am. Um, but again, not too useful. Let's look at what we can do with it. Well, actually, not too much. Okay, this just contains information about it, so we can get the x and y values that we had fed in. Okay, we can, but otherwise, there's only so much that that we can do. It still behaves in the same way, though, that we can feed it our x values, or even more of them if we like, and it returns them all to us. Notice, though, that by itself, it doesn't provide a simple way of doing integrals and derivatives. If we look in here, there's some routines that can help us do that, but frankly, I don't use those. Okay. Um, there's a different interface for splines. Yes, it's unfortunate that this is the way that it is. And again, in here, there's various different types of splines and interpolators and various crazy things pretty much the only one that I ever use in this is interpolated univariate spline, which is quite a mouthful. But its name does actually tell you what it is. And with tab completion, at least, I can get, the, get there very quickly. OK, so documentation for it. So it fits a one-dimensional spline for a given set of data points. So it fits a spline of degree k to the provided points line passes through the points, tells us it's equivalent to, to something else. It's an interpolated spline because it passes through all the points. If you just use univariate spline, that does something a little different, which we're not going to talk about, at least certainly not here. So for us, the important things really are just x and y. Okay. Now the definition, again, not so useful. Fortunately, it tells us the parameters here and x and y being the important parameters. And oh, it's got this little note, must be increasing. If they're not, bad things are going to happen, as we'll see in class. For our purposes, though, we can just use this xy. OK, again, it returns us something. So let's just call it sp for spline. Short, not such a good name, but that's OK. OK, we can get help on it help looks pretty similar to what we saw before. So again, what does it really mean? We can look at what is in it. <coughs> OK, there's various things. Integral, derivative, derivatives, get the coefficients, the knots. OK, all sorts of crazy things. Once again, I will leave most of that to you if you're really interested in it. For our purposes, once again, we can feed it a list of values and it returns the spline evaluated at those points. So we can plot those. I don't know, let's make this a 
green dashed line. If we look at the plot, it actually might be hard to see, but it falls pretty much on top of the other, uh, uh, the you know, Lagrange interpolating polynomial. You can zoom in a bit and see that, yes, it really does fall really pretty much quite right on top. Okay, so it does a very good job of mimicking uh, the higher order polynomial using lower order polynomials, which is nice. What's also nice about this is that we can easily calculate derivatives and integrals. So if we look at integral, for example, basically we call it with a and b, and it will integrate from a to b of the function. So uh, let me just pick some 3. That is presumably the integral of our function. Remember, our function was e to the minus x over 3 from 1.1 1 .1 to 3, and we could compare how well that works, or how accurate that is. We can also calculate uh, derivative. We just use the derivative function. It will do that for us. Okay. Notice that this uh, constructs a spline. Now this is relatively new. Notice it tells me that this was added in SciPy version uh, 13, which is the latest one which I have. So you, in fact, may not have this function. So we're going to talk about a different way of doing it. If we look at derivatives, what this does is this calculates the derivatives. We turn all derivatives of the spline at point x. So if we want to know the derivatives of this function at 1.1, 1 .1, here they are. Notice there's four values listed. We used a cubic spline. If we use a cubic polynomial, there's, well, the function, that's if you like the zeroth derivative, and then the first, second, and third derivative. If you try to calculate the fourth derivative of a cubic polynomial, we get zero, so that's nonsense. Okay. So that's nice. This gives us all the der possible derivatives at a point. Well, that's nice, but that's often not what we want, and I think that's partly why the derivative function was also added more recently. Fortunately, we can evaluate the derivative in another way. Now, when I just call the, the spline with a value, it returns that value. So this should be the same as that. Okay, more digits printed here, but it's the same value. This also takes an argument new, well, which we can either either specify, let me first specify this way. Uh, and if we specify 0, that calculates the 0th derivative of that, so that's the same. If we specify 1, that gives me the first derivative. Notice that these two values are the same. I don't have to give it by name, okay, but I tend to anyway. What's nice about this is we can now feed this an array of values. Let's feed in the original x's. And it calculates all the derivative, all the first derivatives at once. So this is the first derivative of the function as determined by our spline at all the points that we had put in. We do it for more of them. Okay? We can calculate the third derivative. That answer shouldn't surprise you. What's the third derivative of a cubic? It's a constant. So that's the constant. Okay, we calculate the second derivative will be slightly more interesting. Okay, so these are the main functions that we are going to be interested in using. And in fact, for splines, so I typically use the uh, interpolated univariate spline. Uh, the Lagrange interpolating polynomial is useful. The interp 1D is can be useful depending on what we want to do. Uh, so we're just going to have to play around with them. So in class on Wednesday, we will use these a little bit more and talk about inverting functions and some other things that we can do with them.